During the 1999-2000 academic year, Father Galaza served as Dean of the Lutheran Theological Academy in Ukraine, presently the Ukrainian Catholic University, for which he was awarded the Jeweled Pectoral Cross by then Bishop Lubomir Usar. Uh, in 2003-2004, Father Galaza was a research fellow at Harvard University's Dumbarton Oaks Byzantine Research Center in Georgetown, Washington, D.C. In 2004, his book entitled The Theology and Liturgical Work of Andrei Shaptitsky appeared in the series Orientalia Christiana Analecta, edited by Robert Taft. His wife, Alenka, is a high school teacher and iconographer. They have three children, Daniel, Marika, and Ivanka. Please welcome Father Peter. grateful that um, Annette is a superb can of water. She was able to pronounce uh, Orientalia uh, Christiana Analecta without any problems. Uh, some of you may already have uh, a, a copy of, of my paper, uh, but you know, I'm going to ask Annette or someone else. Um, um, uh, Deacon, you uh, Cyril, thanks a lot, uh, because some people might just wander in. Uh, the reason I decided to, to print up a copy uh, is because I knew that um, I'm going to be speaking at what? What is it now? 3:30? Whatever. Uh, I'm sorry if if, uh, if you think you're tired, uh, you should imagine how I feel. I've been running on fumes for the last couple of uh, days. And I figured that if I gave you a copy that you can follow along, you might just stay awake. And if you stay awake, that'll help me stay awake, okay? Um, the, the other reason it was easy to, to uh, print this up uh, in advance, because this is actually a recycled paper. Uh, I at first didn't think of uh, presenting at, at this conference. And then it struck me a couple of weeks ago that a paper that I uh, presented for a group of only 30 liturgists last year at the Catholic University of America uh, is a paper that no one here uh, has heard. And since the area, the Toronto area, has the highest concentration of Ukrainian Catholics outside of Ukraine, and this uh, uh, Eastern Catholic worship aid is intended primarily for Ukrainian Catholics, it might make sense to actually talk about this book here. Now, you may dispute whether this is a seminal Eastern Catholic worship aid, but uh, in either case, it is a, a worship aid used predominantly by Eastern Catholics, uh, sorry, Ukrainian Catholics, and um, so I figured, uh, especially since we were trying to get three sessions into each parallel session, um, that it would make sense to just pad the, the program with another paper, uh, maybe from me. Uh, I'm able to go on, blabber on like this because, believe it or not, my paper is only about 25, 30 minutes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pardon? Hallelujah. 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 Believe that you can actually maybe take a nap. Uh, read the paper really quickly now and then doze off. <laughs> so the title is, uh, as you have surmised, uh, the full conscious and active participation, Sacrosanctum Concilium's influence on a seminal Eastern Catholic worship aid. Sacrosanctum Concilium, for those of you who don't know, is the Vatican II decree on liturgy, which, by the way, is not to be confused with, uh, with the Eastern use of the word liturgy. A lot of people think it's just about the divine liturgy. Well, it's, it's about worship uh, as, uh, as a whole. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that Sacrosanctum Concilium specifically points out which, or it makes the statement that there are parts of this decree, which is actually a constitution, okay, because you've got dogmatic constitutions, and you have disordinary constitutions, and you have decrees. Well, this constitution has sections that are to be appreciated by all the churches, whether Latin Rite or not, and then it says, and there are things that are specific to the Latin Rite. Now, every once in a while, you'll come across a phrase that you're not exactly sure, okay, does this apply to all of the churches or just to the Latin Rite? And that's something that, you know, liturgists and lawyers have had to 
to uh, wrap their heads around. But in either case, for anyone who thinks, because I've actually heard people say Sacrosanctum Concilium has no relevance for Eastern Catholics. Uh, that's nonsense. And uh, not only is it relevant, it has actually had some very, very positive influence uh, on um, various Eastern Catholic churches. And certainly, I would like to think that it has very positively influenced the creation of this uh, worship aid, which is called the Divine Liturgy and Anthology for Worship. So July uh, 2013 saw the third printing of this book, the Divine Liturgy and Anthology for Worship. It was first issued um, in 2004, and this predominantly English language pew book now has a combined print run of almost 10,000 copies. So that's the only reason that I venture to say that it's seminal. I mean, uh, you know, whether people really like it or not, it is at least uh, sold almost 10,000 copies. And this, by the way, does not include the vast number of pirated photocopies of sometimes large sections of the book, nor the digital pages legally displayed on several websites. Now, you notice that I didn't even have a chance to uh, review my text from, from last year from the Catholic University of America, because I have a, a paragraph here which is actually uh, not appropriate for this context. So. Um, instead of reading the eve of the 10th anniversary of the anthologies first printing, should read the 10th anniversary of the anthologies first printing and the 51st anniversary of Sacrosanctum and Chile's promulgation seems an appropriate time to reflect on a pivotal degree's significant influence on a seminal worship aid. Sooner or later, as editor-in-chief of the anthology, I was bound to reflect in print on this influence, and I'm happy that our um, conference uh, here gives me uh, an opportunity to do this, and I'm even happier that the symposium on Sacrosanctum Concilium in Washington last year um, provided me, or rather compelled me to do so. Now, having referred to my role as editor-in-chief, I should note that in spite of this position, I am hardly, and may I repeat again, I am hardly a blind apologist for everything found between the two covers of this 1,166-page volume. Worship is a corporate reality, and a large book codifying such a collective endeavor will inevitably include items that not every worshiper, not even the book's editor, is enthusiastic about. However, in sum, I'm convinced that the anthology makes a marked contribution to facilitating full, conscious, and active participation in worship. And while there are scores of other aspects of the book that I would eventually like to analyze, today I will center my attention on this aspect alone. Which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, uh, that phrase, full, conscious, active participation, is universally recognized among liturgists as the most important phrase of Sacrosanctum Concilio and probably one of the more important um, aspects or, or shall we call it um, impetuses um, deriving from Vatican II as a whole. Before proceeding, however, several caveats. First, I do not, of course, believe that worship is a book. Thus, I do not believe that worshipers should be encouraged to bury their heads in a text. Second, in spite of the anthology's preference for congregational chant, the ancillary participation of choirs or the use of more demanding choral pieces should never be discouraged. Third, the codification of the chants found in the anthology hopefully will not deter the development of a more contemporary North American musical idiom. That, of course, may be a long way off. It's going to probably take us another 20, 30 years to see that happening um, in, on a more regular basis, but it's already happening, thank God. And there's some really nice uh, compositions that might be referred to as expressing a, a contemporary North American musical idiom. Uh, I shall return to all these points in one way or another later in my paper. So full conscious active participation. The three key adjectives of Sacrosanctum Chilean's paragraph 14 will each serve separately to guide my discussion. I will leave the Latinists to discuss why 
the English section of the Vatican's website actually translates our phrase as fully conscious and active, while the French and German renderings on the very same website retain the now standard full, conscious, and active. My preference... Sorry? Oh, some, I thought somebody said something. Uh, my preference for the latter not only derives from the fact that I began my work uh, on my paper before I noticed the Vatican website's distinctive rendering, but also from the fact that, like most Eastern Christians, I tend to see scripture as part of tradition, and certainly in the case of paragraph 14 of Sacro Sancto Concilium, the triple adjectival phrase has become quite traditional. So full participation. Among the features of an already weighty tome that might strike one as, as an odd embellishment is the anthology's catechetical and preparatory material. Does one really need an examination of conscience and prescriptions for fasting, not to mention the text of the Sunday Matins Gospels and minor hours, the first, third, and six to ninth hours, in a book intended for the Eucharist? To begin with, uh, or to begin with the, the most pedestrian, or should I say, posterior answer, it seemed that with most Ukrainian Greco-Catholic churches having pews, it might be wise to include material that can be read or perused by worshippers as they sit in anticipation of the service's beginning. Considering what sometimes passes for reading material in church, this decision does not seem uh, unreasonable. I will never forget, um, uh, I think he's passed on, so, but I won't mention his name. Anyway, I remember him, like, you know, I, just as I'm looking at Brian Daly, I remember this parishioner of mine in Chicago, who many Sundays had been coming in for uh, the, the liturgy, and there he would be in probably the third or fourth pew. Fortunately, it was off to the side, but it was the third or fourth pew, uh, preparing for the Divine Liturgy by reading the Chicago Tribune <laughs> in, in, in full sight of everyone. It was like, you know, it was as if he were in his kitchen or something, you know. So, you know, providing something else for people to read might not be a bad idea. Besides, there was the nudge of tradition. Since at least the Habsburg takeover of Western Ukrainian territories in the late 18th century, the Viennese sovereign's commitment to popular enlightenment, and they were really amazing in this respect, the Habsburgs really helped the, the, the Ukrainian Catholics, their commitment to popular enlightenment uh, resulted in the regular inclusion of catechetical and more generally educational material in Greco-Catholic prayer books. Turning to a more elevated rationale, certainly scripture and tradition require that worship be existentially integrated. The bane of liturgy, especially among certain Eastern Christians, has been its divorce from life. That's why Schneemann was, was so concerned about reintegrating liturgy and life. I take the phrase full participation to presume a vital fusion of the quotidian, in other words, the daily on the one hand, and the ritualized. For this to happen, the liturgy must begin not only when worshippers leave their homes for church, a la the thought of Alexander Schneemann, but to adapt the Diataxis of Philotios Kokinos from the night before. As the 14th century text proclaims, the priest, and ideally God's priestly people, should abstain and be vigilant from the preceding evening, be reconciled to all, and keep their hearts pure to the extent that this is possible. This spirit of vigilance dominates orthodox liturgical spirituality. And, and while the demands of ascetical preparation have come to inhibit some orthodox from a more regular reception of the Eucharist, the principle of preparation remains a sine qua non for logiki latria, which is what? Well, the reason I kept it in the original Greek is because we could do about four hours just on the translation of that phrase, logiki, latria. Uh, the RSV translates it as spiritual worship. Um, there are all sorts of ways to translate it. It's um, St. Paul, Romans 12, 1. I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your very bodies as a sacrifice 
Your, in other words, the presenting of your very bodies as a sacrifice, is your logiki latria, which uh, in this, well, the, the Ukrainian Catholic official translation of the Divine Liturgy is rendered rational worship. You can see where they got that from, logikos, you know, rational. Others believe that logiki is intended to be understood in a more kind of broader sense of the translation. Spiritual worship, as I just mentioned. Uh, I actually prefer to have a footnote which uh, would suggest that in view of the way the word logos functions in Greek, I mean, logos is the principle of integration. Why are we able to grasp anything? Why does anything make sense because of a word? So I, I would say that logiki latria can be uh, translated as integrated or, well, integrated worship. Worship that integrates everything about the human person, which is why St. Paul is saying, offer your very bodies as the sacrifice, you know, the wholeness of you. The inclusion of the uh, 11 Matins, Resurrection of Gospels, is particularly significant. In all of North America, not more than seven or eight Ukrainian Greco-Catholic parishes celebrate Sunday Matins. In fact, I'm probably erring on the optimistic side. It's probably not even seven uh, or eight, but anyway, and even though the contours, and by the way, the fact that uh, you only have uh, seven or eight parishes doing this, or even less, is odd because the contours of Byzantine Rite Orthros, or Matins, are already discernible in Egeria's fourth century diary. Now you can say, well, that's all very nice, that's history. Well, for some reason, basically every Greek Orthodox parish in North America is able to do Sunday Matins, every Sunday. I, I don't know what the issue, well, actually, I do know what the issues are. But anyway, as my dad always said, if somebody can do it, you can do it too. You know? So if the Greeks can pull it off, maybe the Greek Catholics can pull it off. So the absence of this part of the liturgy of the hours, in other words, regular Sunday uh, matins, should not, however, accelerate the loss of Byzantine Eucharistic theology's resurrectional accents. As the anthology puts it, Prayer for reflection on these passages, in other words, the, the resurrection narratives, is among the best way to prepare for the Sunday Eucharist. For these resurrection narratives proclaim that the one whose body and blood we shall be receiving is indeed alive. You know, there are a lot of people who think that you're receiving a dead Christ in the Eucharist, right? He's the crucified Christ. Well, that runs counter to, to everything that uh, you read in good patristic theology. So before you're even receiving the Eucharist, you're hearing the proclamation of the resurrection. So that's the body and blood you're receiving. It's the live, the living body and blood. Thus, fullness here refers also to an amplitude of theological vision and inspiration. Along similar lines, the anthology makes an attempt to restore generally ignored Eucharistic vigil services. In the Byzantine Ordo, Pascha, Christmas, and Theophany, uh, Theophany Eve, so those three feasts, their Eve, retain their primitive significance as the feast's first Eucharist. So the first Eucharist of Christmas uh, is frequently celebrated at like 9 a.m. or 7 a.m., you know, the day before. The first Eucharist of Pascha is celebrated at like, you know, 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., 11 a.m., on the Saturday before Pascha. Um, naturally, the lections and hymnography of these Vesper liturgies carry a great deal of the festal weight. However, for most communities of the Byzantine tradition, whether Orthodox or Catholic, these services, at best, are shunted to the morning hours of the Eve, just like the pre-1952 Latin Easter Vigil. They are shunted to the morning hours of the eve with little impact on the parish's life. The anthology proposes a series of abbreviations that sacrifice the ordinary parts of Vespers, and then some, in favor of the festal readings and most of the distinctive hymnography. Of course, one should have no illusions about restoring these services. In today's social climate, even a 90-minute as opposed to two and a half hour service on the eve of Christmas or Theophany, stands little chance of being introduced. I say that with a very heavy heart, and I should add um, you know, the word tragically. However, for those willing to make 
the counter-cultural leap, presumably any help will be welcome. So this is a way to encourage priests who say, hey, you know, on Christmas Eve, I'm already going to be doing various things. If you want me to do at 4 or 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening uh, uh, another service, the Vesper Liturgy, you're going to have to give it to me in a form that's, that's doable. And the way it's presented in the anthology makes it doable within an hour and a half, which is about half the length that it normally would be. Incidentally, the anthology also contains a proposal for restoring initiation to the Paschal Vigil. Eastern liturgists have been discussing this for decades with negligible results. But even where it has been attempted, it frequently occurs on Holy Saturday morning, a rather odd time for Vespers, not to mention being an odd time for the proclamation of the Paschal Gospel. Another aspect of, of fullness, I'm still talking about full, get to conscious and active, but another aspect of fullness as it relates to the anthology's contents is the inclusion of chorales. This is a unique feature of uniate worship. Orthodox churches have tended to forbid the use of Western-style metrical hymnody, although there are exceptions. But if I may be allowed some sarcasm, I suspect, at least irony, I suspect that if Constantinople's fall had occurred in 1853 or 1953 as opposed to 1453 this western musical genre would also be found today in orthodox worship now this is not to suggest that these uniate chorales always constitute an enrichment of eastern worship uh, professor kudrick at the new theological academy at that time was called the Greco Catholic Theological Academy in Review in the 1930s wrote about these banal American style chants, or, or rather hymns, that some of our religious orders have introduced into our worship in the last 40 years. So he was referring to uh, things like. Um, He's just, I mean, it's like a piano exercise, right? Well, believe it or not, uh, I'm anticipating myself here, but believe it or not, um, we were compelled to include an English version of that in here, okay? <laughs> Which is why I told you that I do not subscribe and or endorse everything uh, that's in here. And let me actually then maybe summarize this by referring, uh, returning to the text. So, um, as, as I've just said much more graphically, a fair number of these kinds of chorales composed in the late 19th and early 20th century, by the way, as opposed to those composed in the 17th century, for example, but a fair number of those composed in the late 19th and early 20th century can be downright banal. And the handful of the banal ones that have entered the anthology belong to those parts of the book that I do not mentioned indoors. But there are others that are gems, and they provide a participatory fullness otherwise difficult to achieve. Think of the following, you're in the Ukrainian Catholic Church, uh, everybody's kind of drawn all of a sudden communion comes and you start singing all of a sudden everybody's singing, or you know, right? Well, why would anybody not want to use that kind of resource. You know, it's, it's a purely, purely kind of formalistic principle that would prevent you from doing that. Now, of course, I know that some people believe it is much better just to repeat the canonicon over and over again, but, you know, it would seem to me that there's only a certain number of times that one can repeat, you know, Sunday after Sunday, receive the body of Christ, taste the fountain of immortality, without saying, well, you know, that there is, uh, I think, a a broader uh, repertory that, that uh, is and should be made available. So, as I just mentioned, this is because these chorales uh, enable worshippers whose musical ability might be limited to join in the singing. If all the members of, the, of Christ's body are to participate in praising the Father according to their abilities, 
then certainly a genre that facilitates singing among musically challenged members should not be spurned. Besides, there is also the possibility of a thematic fullness that otherwise might never emerge. I have in mind the fact that while no one in any Byzantine church can hope to see new Tropadia, canons, Tikira, etc., introduced into canonical worship, except when a new commemoration of feast is created. On the other hand, chorales are sung at liturgical soft points, before the service, during communion, and after the service. Thus, they are easily introduced. And the attractiveness of the chorale's metric structure is demonstrated by the fact that while theoretically one could also compose neutral body or canons, etc., for use during such soft points, this almost never happens. Now, when I read this uh, paper in Washington last year, there's a Greek Orthodox liturgist who said that, believe it or not, in Greece, there actually are a lot of individuals who are composing new stifira, new tropadia. There are so many of them that there's a synodal commission that has been created in Athens to review these new compositions. Okay? So that's, that's marvelous because it, it you know, creates the possibility of new theological themes or revived theological themes emerging. But the question still remains, is that music singable? In other words, <coughs> chant, which I'm sure you realize dare not be marginalized or denigrated, uh, chant nonetheless remains a lot more difficult for a lot of people <coughs> to handle, whereas a metric hymn is, is very easy. The idea is to really have the best of both worlds, I, I would suggest. So, um, new chorales do continue to be written. If you go to Ukraine, you hear all sorts of wonderful new chorales that have been composed in the last 20 years. And they're there being some in Greco Catholic communities. And when they are scripturally or theologically grounded and poetically felicitous, they constitute a living enfleshment of living tradition. The tradition that should be able to overcome the Ottoman takeover of Constantinople in, in 1453, which created you know, a kind of freezing of uh, Eastern or rather Byzantine worship. Finally, I should mention that most, the, the most obvious aspect of participatory fullness found in uh, the anthology, and this is its inclusion of essentially everything that a worshiper needs to participate in all of the Eucharistic services of the Byzantine tradition, as well as services or blessings frequently appended to the latter. This makes it the equivalent of a kind of cantor's service book. Now, to those who would argue that the average worshiper does not need such a book, my response is, first, what is an average worshiper? And then, why not? This anticipates, in part, our next section on conscious participation, but let me say that, theoretically, there is no reason why the majority of people in church cannot become as proficient in their knowledge of the service as the cantor. And proof of this, which takes it beyond theory, is the Carpathal Russian Church of the late 19th and early 20th century. These uniates were actually extolled in writing, it's a wonderful article, by the famed Russian Orthodox musicologist Johann von Gardner, who witnessed how the average Carpathian villager not only owned the Slavonic equivalent of Edida Muzuadis, minus the musical notation, but actually sang the ordinary and propers of Byzantine offices uh, as complicated as vespers and matins. Of course, as I've noted above, congregations need not and should not necessarily sing everything. But erring on the side of maximalism is certainly a pardonable error. Well, it's just, uh, not a biographic note. My father, um, when uh, he was fleeing the front uh, with my uh, three oldest siblings in, in uh, July 1944, they're going through the Carpathian Mountains, and uh, I think it was, uh, it was the eve of some feast, and he walks into church, and he noted this in his diary. Um, I, was, I was really uh, amazed. Not only does everyone in the church at the Vesper service have an Isborek, but among the everyone uh, are the women. So women of different ages, are holding, and he's a book that would have been uh, actually a little bit taller than this, and probably just about as wide, 
And all of them, including the women, are actually following along for everything, including the propers. These stanzas, these compositions that uh, are sung to, at times, rather complicated chants. I mean, we think they're complicated, but that's just because we haven't grown up with them. So um, that's, you know, 20 years after uh, Gardner's observations, my father had the very similar uh, experience, except that it related more specifically to the kind of book that people were holding. Conscious participation. Let me begin this section of my paper with two quotations from Byzantine worship. The Ecteni, a litany sung after the Gospel at, um, at Eucharistic and some other services, begins. Ipomen pantes ex oristis psychis ex oristis dianias imon ipomen. Which I will translate right away. It's basically, let us all say that, oh my own soul. The Kondakion of Theophany, a proper hymn of the feast reads, Epiphany simeron di ecumeni, ketofosu kirie, isimiothi efimas, en epignosi imnuntas ser. So note the words diania and epignosis. The former denotes one's thinking faculty or understanding, while the latter, of course, is simply knowledge. The Byzantine deacon exhorts the assembly to pronounce the Kyrie eleison with all of ex olis, their thinking faculty, while the Contakion of Theophany speaks of the assembly hymning the Lord with knowledge. In Slavonic, it's vorazumi poyushtich tja. Now, without, of course, any desire to promote an overly cerebral approach to knowledge and understanding, I would nonetheless insist that the tendency within certain Eastern Christian circles to downplay the intellectual and cognitive in worship has far more to do with a mystification derived from centuries of theological decline than with any desire to safeguard the mystery. Consequently, while it would be wrong to ask worshipers to stand for 90 minutes following texts in a book, Depriving them, on the other hand, of the opportunity to do so, or to at least regularly consult such a book, can only bolster such mystification, not to mention downright ignorance. In other words, I'm not saying that you, know, you have to kind of push this in people's faces, but there are actually parishes where the people are told you shouldn't hold any kind of text during the service. I mean, that just doesn't seem logical to me. I will spare the, this audience the accounts of regular Byzantine Rite churchgoers and even prospective cantors who are unaware of basic themes or dimensions of chants that they have heard since childhood only because they have either never used a book or text during services or used versions of the latter that only minimally fostered thinking, understanding, and knowledge. Whether anyone likes it or not, in the post gutenberg age, people tend to rely sooner or later on a visual appropriation of the message. Now, having stressed this, however, note that the anthology does not include any lections. This is not only because the Byzantine churches do not uh, yet have an English lectionary worth codifying, but especially, even if we did have a good lectionary worth codifying, uh, the Word of God should be appropriated by attending to the full-bodied proclamation and fleshed in the lector's very muscles and breath. Speaking of scripture, the anthology also fosters conscious participation by including the biblical sources of the scriptural chants. The book also attempts to heighten understanding by providing what might be considered mystagogical signposts in the text of the Eucharist's ordinary. Via short headings, the worshippers inform, for example, that the Eucharist's goal is God's kingdom. He, she, or he or she learns that the entrance of the gospel should foster reverence for the word of God in anticipation of its proclamation. He, she realizes that the kiss of peace was historically exchanged by the laity and not just the clergy, and that its function is to reconcile all as they prepare to offer sacrifice. Naturally, all of these mystagogical notes will have uh, their limitations. But even this might generate knowledge if the limitations stimulate discussion. Turning to an element of Eastern Christian worship that deadens all consciousness, note how the anthology attempts to overcome routinization those of us born and raised in uh, this tradition know well that if essentially the same chants are used on a regular basis, the task of remaining attentive becomes difficult indeed. Consequently, the anthology includes not only a different set of ordinary chants for weekdays as opposed to Sundays and feasts, 
But even within these categories, at least two options are always provided. Now, of course, the Islamic repertory includes infinitely more options, but a congregation, unlike a choir, cannot be expected to master that kind of diversity, which is why choirs should certainly be retained for parts of the service. And such choral participation, incidentally, also counters routinization. Note that the above-mentioned chorales, with their diversity of themes, meters, intervals, and chords, also serve to overcome monotony. Active participation, the third um, category. Throughout its pages, the anthology includes directives, suggestions, indications, etc., for particular actions to be undertaken by the assembly. These go beyond standard references to actions such as the communion procession. Some, in fact, reflect Greco-Catholic practices that, much like the chorales, have not been received in most Orthodox communities, even though they reflect an organic development of tradition. For example, at the so-called Little Entrance, the anthology reads, where children or others approach the Gospel to venerate it during the Little Entrance, they begin moving to the front of the church now. The practice of having at least some worshippers kiss the gospel as it is brought into the nave during this entrance is a West Ukrainian and Carpathian particularity, imitative, no doubt, of the kissing of the Torah, uh, the Torah scroll, in Jewish synagogues. As is well known, for centuries, Jews and Ukrainians lived side by side in the shtetls of this region, and in the absence of liturgical police, in other words, imparchial commissions regulating such practice, Ukrainian and Ruthenian burghers and peasants spontaneously began performing the most natural of actions during one of the more illogical rites of the Byzantine liturgy. Uh, I'm, well, you know what? This is, well, I'll allow myself to, to, to say this, even though it's being recorded. Uh, a really good Greek Orthodox uh, friend of mine, uh, a late pastor on Long Island, used to refer to the little entrance as taking the gospel out for air. <laughs> and, you know, you, you think of it, uh, what else are people going to imagine is going on? Because, of course, it's originally a procession that you can eventually, uh, the way it's done now, can only be interpreted allegorically. So, you know, the peasantry, these, these poor people in Western Ukraine get it right when they say, oh, here's this, you know, I'm not interested in any kind of allegorical interpretation of, you know, Christ coming into the world. So, you know, the gospel is here. I want to kiss it. The gospel, which has been on the, the, the holy table the, the whole time, is now in my midst. I want to approach it. And at that point, you don't need to explain with any kind of allegory what's going on. This is an anticipatory veneration of the gospel. It's anticipatory because we're going to hear that same word in about five, ten minutes, you know. Um, Practices such as this, as well as the custom of, of having members of the uh, assembly, especially the youth, encircle the ambo holding candles during the proclamation of the gospel, have revived in some parishes as a result of the anthology's directives. Unfortunately, for some, this raises the neuralgic uh, question of worship and alleged busyness or gimmickry. Believe me, I am not into gimmickry, liturgical gimmickry. We had enough of that. Um, in uh, previous decades. I certainly belong to those who would insist that any uh, attempt, however, to bifurcate or juxtapose inner and outer liturgical activity reflects a Platonizing anthropology far removed from authentic Christian soteriology. So one person's gimmickry can be another person's uh, expression of a full-bodied unity of inner and outer, you know. So the idea of including the, the muscular, you know, the movement, etc. I mean, if, 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 if it's done in a mindless way without any sense of anything, just, just to get people, you know, moving, it, it can be gimmickry, but at the same time it can be a, a very uh, tangible way uh, for people to experience God's presence. Father, well, could you just give an example of what you think is gimmickry? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I've... Uh, if, Let's stick with uh, Byzantine Rite um, services. I mean, you know, it's one thing to include children in some kind of procession. It's another thing to say, today we're going to do a procession with balloons, okay? I mean, the balloon, uh, the basic principle is that if it's a, a cheap item, it can be gimmickry. Okay? Uh, there's a way of doing a, a homily with children that is pure gimmickry, 
where what tends to dominate is kids just passing the microphone uh, uh, around. I mean, I've seen this, by the way, it's really become a big thing in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, they, you know, they got McDonald's and now liturgical gimmickry coming from the West. Uh, where the, the priest gets up to, to, to preach and it, they're, it's one thing to include the kids in your homily, it's another thing to say, okay, what do you think, what do you think, what's the, and, and they, they literally pass the microphone around, and it's because uh, the idea is you want to include them, you know, and so the message, well, the medium becomes the message, as, as we all know, and what, what is the medium here? It's kind of like this little sort of campfire jamboree sort of thing, which is, you know, I love campfire jamborees, but, you know, you want to, you know, you want something a little bit more elevated during the divine liturgy. So, um, the two practices referenced above highlight the participation of young people. It was not the gimmickry, but the, the good stuff. The focus on their liturgical activity and formation extends to reading in church. However, the trend to include young people in such activity by having them read the epistle or other elections has generally been an ineffective exercise in paternalism. The epistle is far too important a text to be used as a tool for youth affirmation. However, we do want our kids learning to read and proclaim. So however, however, another possibility for liturgical formation suggests itself and has been codified in the anthology. The introduction to the minor hours reads, and there's introduction to first hour, third, etc. The hours are an ideal way to prepare adolescents for roles as lectors and cantors. It is precisely these young parishioners who can easily perform the task of reading these offices before the start of the Eucharistic liturgy, a tradition that relies so heavily on singing requires that worshipers be introduced as early as possible to all the dynamics involved in that hallowed action. We have a shortage of competent lectors today in our churches because they start learning the art way too late. If they've been acclimated to this from adolescence, they don't say malice instead of malice. They don't talk about um, God who dwells um, in, uh, what is the one? You, they're always confusing immortality and immorality. <laughs> <and love. laughs> <laughs> so much more could be said about active uh, participation and how the anthology promotes it, but obvious features such as the inclusion of a harmony and bass part for the chants, as well as rubrical notes for the entire assembly regarding the order of propers, and indications as to how the prokimenon, a responsorial, uh, may I remind everyone, how the Prokimenon can be announced so that the entire assembly actually responds. All of these and many more are geared toward helping Eastern Catholics immerse themselves in the primary and indispensable source from which they, the faithful, are to derive the true Christian spirit. That is a um, quotation from Sacrosanctum Concilium, which uh, actually um, derives in part from Lambert Baudouin, who was actually preceded in that, uh, that sensibility by Metropolitan Andrei Shevtitsky. If you want to read about that, you can purchase, there's still one copy left in my doctoral dissertation, it's only $50. <laughs> <laughs> my conclusion. For centuries, discussions of Eastern Catholic, or Uniate worship, have been mired in polemics over Latinization versus Easternization. Hopefully, this brief reflection has helped us expand the discourse. Now, obviously, nobody wants Latinization, but you'd think that 50 years after Vatican II, we would have dealt with that. Well, as we realize, we still haven't dealt with that. But we do have to hope for a better day and that we won't have to worry much about Latinization. But hopefully, this brief reflection has helped us expand the discourse. As a fair amount of recent reflection by Eastern Orthodox liturgists demonstrates, besides illegitimate Latinization, there is legitimate Occidentalization. 
And certainly the latter's legitimacy derives from a grounding in sound biblical and patristic theology, not to mention historical precedent. Hopefully the anthology can become an instrument in the process of legitimate and healthy occidentalization. Everybody else is supposed to enculturate except the Eastern Christians. This is a bizarre phenomenon considering that you know, the Eastern Christian world is kind of like the home of enculturation, right? So whatever the case, hopefully my presentation has also helped demonstrate that Vatican II was truly a was a truly Catholic event rather than just a Latin event. Thank you very much. I don't see the net to feel. We, uh, okay, we've got, until people start coming back, uh, why don't we just, I mean, maybe some questions. Find out. So you would suggest that the entire congregation sing the oh, absolutely. That's the way it always was throughout the first millennium. Which is uh, why. Um, get a look at this. You'll love this one. As late as 1691, in the Slujavnik of Kiprian Zhukovsky, who was a radical Latinizer, he codified, he actually put into a uh, Slujavnik, this is Slujavnik the Red Mass, or oh, sorry, Red Liturgy, Chitana Služba Boža. But as late as his 1691 Služavnik, he has the rubric that the lecture announces the Prokimenon and its tone. Now, that is something that the Ukrainian Orthodox have held on to, the Russian Orthodox have held on to, uh, even though they, of course, don't have low masses, right? In other words, the Prokimenon is still sung. Irony of ironies, you know, I mean, we all know how political uh, liturgy becomes. Uh, this is something that has caught on in some places, and in some very enlightened places in uh, Western Ukraine, it is suppressed when it's introduced as some kind of Muscovite uh, innovation. So I, I always start with it, because we all know it. You know, and, and for some reason, you know, some Western Ukrainians feel that that's just, I don't know what, I don't know why they, they, they um, maybe they don't, don't like the fact that it's, you know, enunciated so boisterously or whatever, but I mean, the Ukrainian Orthodox do the same thing, and they didn't get it from the Russians. They got it actually from authentic Byzantine practice. And the reason, I mean, in addition to all the manuscripts that we have that demonstrate that, I mean, think of it. What is the Prokimenon? The Prokimenon is what the Latins call a responsorial chant. It's always short. The melodies that the, the uh, Ukrainian Catholics have are eminently singable, you know, I mean, most of them. Um, and so to restore them as a responsorial chant make, makes perfect sense. One of the reasons it becomes a little bit di more difficult is because we really only repeat it once. So it's hard. I mean, the, the original Prokimenon was repeated 10, 15, 20, 30, you know, depending, uh, I mean, it, it evolves throughout history, but you can imagine how, you know, there's a momentum that develops as people repeat this chant, you know, one after another. But anyway, uh, so Kiprian Zhukovsky, this Ukrainian Catholic guy, was, you know, retained this practice even in the low mass of Chitana Yes, Andrew? So I think you could give me a lot of good, maybe think a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, and two questions. Um, you can pitch one if you want. The first question, I guess I've always been interested in what uh, the liturgical movement post-Vatican II did for the Orthodox churches. I know at St. Vladimir's Seminary, David Drulak was usually under the influence of Carpathian Russians, uh, instituted a lot of congregational singing in the chapel there. And uh, I wonder what, that seems to be a very, we, we almost have the monopoly as Greek Catholics on congregational singing. Um, and it seems to be one of the most authentic things that we, unique things that we can offer to this, what you're speaking of. Yeah, you know, I don't know uh, David Drillock's mind on this. What I do know, uh, I mean, it, to nuance your point that he introduced congregational singing, what he introduced, what he was a big fan of, was having 
chants that are nonetheless sung by the choir, in fact, two choirs, but which uh, have repeatable, easily repeatable refrains. You know, so um, you know when uh, Father Glagolov composes a brilliant um, uh, version of Psalm 103, David Drillock was a big promoter of that because you have that easily repeated, you know, so people just, the idea is that people are supposed to sing along with the choir. One of the problems is that there are far too many places within those uh, communities where they have been, uh, where congregational singing has been polemicized against for so long that even when a chant is being used that was intended for congregational inclusion, people still don't participate. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the genius, if there's anything that the Orthodox world can learn from us, you know, benighted uniates from, you know, Galicia and uh, the Carpathian region, it's, I mean, it's, uh, you know, one of the, the tragedies is that, especially with the Carpathian uh, chant, um, it's, it's, all too frequently, and the same kind of thing happens with Galician, but the reason it's more tragic with, with uh, the Carpathian chant is that it is, in principle, such a vibrant chant which in North America, with each passing generation, becomes more and more kind of whatever, just, you know, it's, if you, I grew up where I grew up where we had as many Eastern Catholic or Eastern Christian churches as Roman Catholic ones, the uh, Johnstown Carpathian Russian Parish on, on Fifth Street. I was there in 1968 when the bishop did. 500 people under the leadership of amazing cantors belting out Carpathian chant in such a way that you would think that you were at a Black Baptist convention. And what I always tell people is that that chant only works when it's sung that way. Can you imagine, uh, you know, a Black Baptist congregation singing? I don't know. Give me a Black Baptist, uh, uh, you know, you know, rowdy chant. Can you imagine them just kind of singing on a dreary way? I mean, it would. You know, people would say, well, what's, "What's wrong with you?" You know. Anyway, uh, that's. that's just a quick question. I know you talk about in your book on uh, Shabtisky's uh, liturgical reform about the lack of um, his emphasis on the liturgy hours, particularly mass, right? And there's man of his time, so you know, you got to give him. Uh, this historical doom, but I guess what I would ask you is like, what would an itinerary for the restoration of Matins look like on a practical level in Eastern Catholic? Well, uh, let's put it this way. To, to be proud, I apologize to all the purists, but the fact is if Matins is ever going to be restored in any of our parishes, we're going to have to do it the way the Greeks do it, which is basically lasts about an hour. It's done right before the, the divine liturgy. And you know what, the, the, the Greeks have actually restored, in the 1880s, they did a reform where they restored, they jettisoned the, the Sabaitic uh, Typicon, which has the Gospel being read in the center of Mans, and they return, returned to Constantine Paul usage where the Matins Gospel is at the end. And so what you have is people showing up 10 minutes before the liturgy and they hear the Sunday Matins Gospel. So even somebody just you know, um, I mean, let's face it, most of our people are not going to actually come for matins. They're going to come before the Divine Liturgy, but what a great way to prepare them for the Divine Liturgy by having them hear these 20, 30 minutes of, of a matins. And then, of course, um, what it, I mean, the, the and I, I have to say this because the bane, the reason, by the way, I have no, I'm, I'm not a romantic, uh, and I'm not uh, deluded by anything. The fact is that our liturgical practice in North America is in steep, steep, steep decline for one very simple reason. The Byzantine tradition re requires excellent, superb singing. If you don't have excellent, superb singing, it's like having, going to a Protestant church and having an organ piping away for an hour and a half that is untuned, you know, flat, whatever. That's what's happening in 90% of our churches on a Sunday morning. So we have to begin with, in the Eastern Catholic Church, or Eastern Christian churches, a counter-cultural tradition to begin with. And so we need every conceivable help that we can to overcome the hurdles of being counter-cultural. 
And we don't get it. Nobody. I mean, I've been arguing for, for, for years that until we have good musical training, Cantor's Institute provide, I mean, one of the dreams, we've got a proposal for, for a program in sacred music. Uh, the dream is to have people trained to use their voices properly, to have good articulation, diction, to know, and it's only then that you're going to actually get any kind of authentic liturgical revival in any of our churches. Right now, we, we don't have it. Yes, Cyril. Uh, the Galician style of singing seems to have this nice balance between what's, what's very easily sung by a congregation with uh, more virtuoso pieces like the Dogmaticon at Vespers, the Irmoy at Matins, a couple other things like that. Um, and the anthology reflects that. But I'm, uh, even with those uh, occasional virtuoso pieces or quasi virtuoso pieces, complicated pieces, I regularly hear people say, uh, I don't like the dogmat at Vespers. That's like the down point for me. Whereas, you know, for the cantors, that's always the, the cool part, it's the fun part. But can you suggest, is there an implicit principle, uh, either in our tradition or elsewhere, of balancing uh, congregational and uh, and, uh, and 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 yeah, specialized singing. Like, is it eighty-five, fifteen? Is it fifty? No, 50 the, the problem is that we Galicians were very unimaginative, and we said it's got to be either or. So it's going to be either a choir singing Burdjansky, Vedder, etc., or or the cantor. You know who's brilliant on on this? Go to Slovakia, go to Preshov, where and I've seen this. The choir director is also a cantor. So, they're starting off the liturgy, full congregation, and you know, I mean, those, those Greek Catholics, who, you know, Eastern Slovakia, the Carpathian region, they really know how to sing, okay, there they, they hold on to it. Then all of a sudden comes the only begotten son, the same choir, uh, same conductor, uh, same uh, cantor, turns around to a choir, and they sing a quote-unquote virtuoso piece, you know? So you have this battle, and that, that it continues. In, in Preshov, when I was there on that visit, it was a kind of a 50-50 breakdown. And that's really a, a dream of mine, but, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm not a pastor anywhere, so I only get to do these things with students on, uh, you know, on, on odd occasions. But that really is, is, I think, a very, very important principle that needs to be uh, fleshed in worship. And I don't know what, um, do, do you mind if we take one more question? Because it really, I don't see the rest of the, in fact, I don't see you. Oh, there, there, there are there? one more oh, question. Okay. Sorry, we're very quick, and then we go, sir. Yes. Yes, I was just wondering, at the end of your paper, you, at the end of your paper, you talk about legitimate toxicalization in, yes, the, Eastern, toxicalization in the Eastern Catholic churches. Yeah. I was wondering if you think there is any case for legitimate orientalization in the Latin Catholic church. Well, I can think that, but the fact is that, you know, I don't like them telling us what we should be doing, and I don't want to tell them what they should be doing. No, that was, that was my coy way of just... You know, I'm finishing because we could we could discuss this for, for probably a half hour, but uh, but we'll probably best do it uh, privately. So thank uh, thank you to all of you.